Good evening. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin this study where we're going through uh, the study of righteousness by faith and going through A.T. Jones right now, 18 Jones, uh, 1893 General Conference Bulletin sermons. So we're going to be studying that number six there. So let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have on the Sabbath, especially to study together, to open your word, to receive the blessing that you promise, not just where two or three are gathered together, but the blessing of fellowship on the Sabbath day, and we ask, Lord, that you can direct us. We know that we're reading A.T. Jones, and some of these things are laid out, but we need um, your Holy Spirit to bring to remembrance the things that we've studied in the past, but also to give us insight and understanding. We know, Lord, that um, we live in this world of sin and suffering, we are weakened because of sin, not just our own sins, but the sins of others. But we know through your spirit that we can be strengthened, that we can see as we obey your voice, as we follow on the path where your light is shining. So we ask for your strength this Sabbath, that we can forget the things of the past week that have troubled us, that we can lay them aside lay them at the foot of the cross, and that we can enjoy the fellowship of the Holy Spirit um, uniting our hearts, that we can have the fellowship of Christ. And the Sabbath rest. Mm -hmm. So be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Again, good evening. Now, in this study so far of what Jones has done, and we've gone through it and, and reviewed it a little bit, but Jones is going to do his own summary here of where he's gone so far. But if you remember um, last Sabbath, last Friday night, um, we addressed um, how Jones doesn't really quite understand the Sunday law the way that we do presently. Um now, he believes that the Sunday law is, is basically here. He believes that Revelation 9, 18 has been fulfilled, that the mighty angel of Revelation 18, the second angel's message, has joined with the third angel's message. And then he's looking forward to the plagues. But we can see that there is these pieces missing in his understanding that we have presently because of our understanding, one, of Millerite history. Um, but even, even if you compared it to how we would have understood the Sunday law in the 1990s as Seventh-day Adventists, so Jeff would have, there still seems to be things that as he's approaching what he thinks is the Sunday law, that he, he should know that he's kind of neglecting. And, and we've done the same thing. So we looked a little bit at um, uh, Revelation 17 and 13. Um, last time, and and we looked at the original Sunday Law, of course, March seventh, three twenty one, and and we found in some of our other studies, you know, the connection between um, the studies that we are doing and and the Sunday Law. So the light that God is giving us on the Sunday Law as Seventh Day Adventists and as people in this movement is something that's been ever increasing. But Jones still has some insights that are extremely valuable. Maybe he doesn't even fully understand um, these insights himself. But as he examines the third angel's message in the context of the Sunday law, there are going to be some points uh, that we need to address and things that we will notice uh, that Jones isn't noticing. But we're going to begin with his summary. So Joan says, tonight I propose to take up the kind of summary of what we have had, take up a kind 
of summary of what we have had through the week. And then a further lesson from that. The first night after the report of the hearing was given, which laid the foundation for all our following study, Tuesday night, that was, we took up and noticed three particular points. On Wednesday night, three more. Last night, one more. The three points of the first night, you remember, shut us up to the giving of the third angel's message. Now, as it reads in words, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And that, it, that of itself shows that the time has come when the image is there and that the mark is to be received because the warning is against the worship of the beast and his image and receiving his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The first of the three points was that we are to shut off now from work as we have been conducting it hitherto. And in the work of the message are shut up to the preaching of that message itself as it is in words. So he's saying there's a change that happens in how we are working uh, because, uh, because the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. <clears throat> so we can see that this quite clearly is something that this movement has recognized, that there was a change in in our focus, in our ministry. Specifically, we had a time in which we weren't doing uh, public evangelism, which always had been previously something that the movement had at least focused on to some degree. And some of the groups that had joined the movement were particularly fond of, that is some of them were evangelists and saw themselves as evangelists. So the idea was to reach people, this sort of internal work uh, some of them weren't interested in. So anyway, he's he's going to show how um, <clears throat> we're shut off from the work that we did before, and now we're going to have this message itself that we're going to be preaching, the third angel's message, in a particular way. The second is that this shows that the image is made and that that brings all earthly power into the hands of the enemy of the third angel's message and the cause of God to be wielded against the people of God and the work of God, to be wielded against, uh, and therefore, whoever would stand for God must have a power greater than all the power of the world, right? So um, we have to have a power greater than the, than the world if we're going to stand against the power of the world. And of course, that power comes from God. And the third point was that inciting the fourth commandment in the legislation and interpreting that commandment to mean the first day of the week, commonly called Sunday, thus putting Sunday in the place of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, it is just as literally true that the Protestant churches of this country, by the power of this government, had made void the law of God as far as earthly power can, as was the action of the papacy, the original apostasy, in joining herself to the government to do the same thing. And when that is done, God has put into our mouths these words, it is time for the Lord to work, for they have made void thy law. And that brings to view the further thought that as all the power of the earth is set against God and his Sabbath and his people who keep it, that this people, in order to stand at all, must have a power that is greater than all the power of the earth, and that brought us to that verse, it is time for the Lord to work, for they have made void that law. So he just kind of repeats himself slightly differently. Therefore, we need the power of God. Our daily prayer is, Lord, it is time for thee to work now. We cannot do anything at all. And so we know that the problem that this movement has had, the problem that Seventh-day Adventists have had, is we, we are sufficient we don't recognize that we need this power of God. We think we have it. We have the truth. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We know what's coming. And somehow we're just going to get through it. And, and that we might, you know, need God, of course. But we're not even doing any real preparation for it. That is, we're just kind of hoping it doesn't come too soon because we have lots of things we'd like to accomplish first before Jesus comes back, even though those things are all going to be come to not. I'm not sure why we're that interested in it. 
be much better to be with God than to be on this earth. But we, we don't recognize our need. And we just think that we can handle the things that are coming. We may not say that in words, but we definitely show it by our actions and by how we treat one another. <clears throat> then the first point in the succeeding lesson was that this message is given in view of the fact that the plagues are to come upon those who reject the message. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, so which, of course, would be the seven last plagues. The first plague is poured out upon those who receive the mark of the beast. And under the sixth plague, the kings of the earth are gathered together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. In the time of that battle, the Lord comes and the end of the world. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple in heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Then the next was that in the history of the nations that have gone before, when a nation would no longer seek the Lord, but would turn their backs upon God and set themselves against God. Then there was no more place for them in the world. Ruin was the only thing that followed. As this government has done that, ruin is the only thing to follow here. Now, so you can see where Jones is, and we've, we've talked about this. I mean, he thinks we're further along than we really are. He doesn't understand where he is in the lines. And that actually he's a part of a line that is, is really a part of the progressive destruction of four. That is, in those four generations, lines exist. They're not, they're not the same as the reform lines that exist after a period of darkness, after the progressive, progressive destruction of four. And then you have a period of, in, the fourth is a period of darkness. But they still are reform lines nonetheless. In some ways, they become failed reform lines. And, and we haven't really addressed them completely when it comes to that history. But we did see it when we studied in our morning studies, when we were going through the lines, when we started looking at the story of Abraham. And we could see the progressive destruction of four. And within those progressive destruction of four, the four generations, you can see reform lines definitely exist. But Jones isn't aware of this. Right? He doesn't realize where he is. He just thinks he's on the big line of Ellen White and that he's now at Revelation 18. And then we would ask ourselves, you know, how do we know where we are at? Uh, because this movement has thought we were further along than we were. And, and still, the movement to a large degree thinks that the Sunday, Sunday law is imminent but we know that it isn't because the work that needs to be accomplished isn't occurring. So we, we can't just have the Sunday law pop out of nowhere. This movement is always taught that we are giving a message that prepares the church for the Sunday law. And yet we're not giving a message. We have no kind of organized way of doing that. We just have internal problems. God doesn't want us to give a message in the condition that we are in. We, we would just do more harm than good. By the way, I was looking through special testimonies this evening. I don't know if he says, by the way, or by the way, I was looking through special testimonies this evening. They would need a comma there. And there is a passage so expressive on this point that I turn and read it here. It is on page 16 of special testimonies to ministers in conference committees. It is this, the Christian world has accepted the child of the papacy and cradled and nursed it, thus defying God by removing his memorial and setting up a rival Sabbath. When was that done? That was done when they removed his memorial defying God by removing his memorial and setting up a false Sabbath. 
Now, here is the word we read the other day. God's memorial has been torn down, and in its place, a false Sabbath stands before the world. Well, that was done by the churches securing the power of this government to make their work effective. Then what has this nation been dragging, dragged into doing by the apostate Protestant churches of this country? Into defiance of God. When Belshazzar defied God by taking the sacred, sacred vessels of the house of God and prostituted them to his lascivious worship, then there was no more use for that government in this world. Then this government has been brought into the same place, and ruin is the next thing that comes here. But the ruin of this nation is the ruin of the world because the influence of the nation affects the world. And that ruin is accomplished at the coming of the Lord. And the coming of the Lord is when that great battle is fought and we are right in the presence of it. Now, I just want to bring in a thought here. Is it true that ruin was coming? Like this is 1893. But was ruin coming not just to the United States, but to other countries fairly soon after this? That is, do we have a place prophetically for World War I and World War II? Are these the result of apostasy? You're forgetting one. Well, which one? Spanish-American War. Okay. So, um, which I don't know much about. But yes, I mean, the Spanish-American War, when was that? Just a moment. Yeah, because this is an, an expansion of the United States, right? <clears throat> it was a war against Cuba and against, against Spain. Okay. So this took place from the 21st of April to the 13th of August of 1898. So about five years after this was written. Okay. Yeah, and so I, I only have very sketchy ideas of this war. I know probably Americans, especially those in the southern states, would know more about it. No, this is one <clears throat> that involved America against Spain. Yeah. Because of what was thought to be the destruction of the battleship Maine by Spain. Okay. Now, this has to do with Cuba, though, too. Because Cuba was seeking its independence from Spain at that time, and America was seeking to, as it saw it, the, to give support to Cuban independence. Okay. So if there's no foreign doctrine in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know much about it. Um, just reading here quickly in Wikipedia. Because um, this has to do, um, so Cuba is a colony. Well, they have other colonies too, right? Right. Um, yeah, so, okay. So anyway, we have this war, which I don't know anything about. But it's, what? what's the result of that war? Well, basically on two fronts, you had the Cuban independence, but America also sought to help they make the Philippines independent. Okay. Yeah. I'm reading that there. Now, the, um, <clears throat> the main military officers at that time included Black Jack Pershing, okay. especially in the Philippines. And the thing was that in the Philippines, Pershing had to battle Islam. Okay, yeah, because of the Muslims. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, 
you have the Muslims, you have the Catholics in the Philippines. Um, you know, and again, I'm not an expert on, on the Philippines. I just know because I know some Filipinos. <clears throat> yeah, and I know this summer we, we, there was actually a, because um, where we lived before, we were overlooking City Hall and there was some kind of Philippine celebration. Filipino Day. E yeah, something to do with Philippine independence. Um, but I didn't, you know, we, we were wondering what the flag was and what people were doing there. But so we looked it up and we found out what it was. Um, okay, so, I mean, this wasn't the direction I wanted to go because, you know, I'm interested in the First and Second World War. But Ellen White talks about the spirit of war that was being stirred at that time, right? So she, she hints at what's going to happen in the First World War, which is definitely a major war. I mean, all wars are involve, you know, you know, things that affect people. But we have the First World War, which is definitely, you know, it was called the Great War originally. Uh, involved many, many nations and had millions of casualties. So it was a pretty terrible war. Um, <clears throat> but the point that I'm asking is where, where do we place what happened in these wars prophetically? Do we just ignore them prophetically because they're not connected to Jesus' second coming? Or do we take these wars and, and see them as part of a prophetic line? Wouldn't they all have to be part of a prophetic line? Well, not everything has to be part of a prophetic of the major prophetic lines. I mean, everything I didn't say major. Yeah, but yeah, they're they're going to be part of some prophetic line. The prophetic line specifically, though, is it the prophetic line of the four generations? I mean, we're going to have the the third generation. It's it's going to begin in <clears throat> connection with the first world war. I mean, around that time, right? I mean, we usually mark not the 1919 Bible Conference. Right. So if we look at the First World War, I mean, you have a war that begins um, in, in 1914 and ends in 1918 on November 11th, which is coming up here next Friday. Um. <clears throat> Begins July 28th, 1914. Now, that First World War, shortly after that, we're going to have the 1919 Bible Conference. So the First World War, it um, I'm just reading here in Wikipedia sometimes called the Great War, was a global conflict from July 28th, 1914 to November 11th, 1918, that left unprecedented, unprecedented destruction and death, with millions of people killed. Its belligerence included much of Europe, the Russian Empire, the United States, and the Ottoman Empire. Fighting took place across Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and the Pacific, and parts of Asia. Uh, New technology, including the recent invention of the airplane, trench warfare, and especially chemical weapons, made it one of the deadliest conflicts in history. An estimated 9 million soldiers died in combat, with another 5 million civilian deaths as a result of military actions, hunger, and disease. Millions more died in genocides within the Ottoman Empire and the 1918 influenza pandemic, which was exacerbated by the movement of the combatants during the war. 
So the other thing that we have here, of course, is um, the pandemic that happened in connection with this. So can we take, so, so let's, let's look at it this way. Could we take 1993 as Jones is sort of marking it as the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down and the events that follow typifying the events in our time? You mean 1893? Yeah, 1893. Yeah. Did I say 1993? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so in 1893. I know what I knew there was something wrong with what I was saying, but I, I couldn't figure it out. I think everybody knows what you meant anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1893, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. And we could tie that to 1989. Or not to 1989, to, to 9-11, right? So we're going to take uh, 1893 and 2001, tie them together. And then we're going to see that what happens with 9-11, we have this history that's going to lead to this pandemic. And, and is that something that parallels in that line? And this is going to be the end of the second generation and the beginning of the third generation. And then we're going to have in the third generation, we're going to have World War II, right? Near the end of that uh, period. You know, Advent is used to talk much more about these wars as prophetic than you get today. Mostly we just... We just think there were wars that happened and they have nothing to do really with Bible prophecy other than, you know, the wars and rumors of wars. But they were looking at them as leading to the Sunday law, right? The, the events that were happening in, in history. For them, they were unprecedented, unprecedented events like what we have today. And, and they saw that the end is near, Right. So these must have a role prophetically. That is, we must have a line in these generations that illustrate what happens at the end of the world. Now, if we look at the, the first generation, but right, that's going to be the generation that goes from 1844 to 1888, right? I know Jeff liked to put it back to 1798, but, you know, I had reasons why I didn't agree with him on that. Because well, 1798, they were just, just getting started. I mean, it was just, yeah. Miller wasn't <laughs> even a uh, uh, pastor or credentials yet. Yeah, so so the first generation of Adventism, I mean, would have to be the Adventism connected with Seventh Day Adventism, right? So, but anyway, I just you know, Jeff did kind of accept that you could have both ways, but but the point is, we have the first generation, eighteen forty four to eighteen eighty eight, and we have a civil war in the eighteen sixties that we. We know is typical. It contains elements of a reform line in it. We look, Ellen White's visions are connected with the symbols of 1844. You know, the, the Civil War starts on the first day of the first month. Ellen White, you know, has her first vision and her second vision and her third vision. They're all part of this structure that we've looked at before. So, so we have the Civil War. So that's the first generation. But in the second generation, we're going to have the Great War, World War I. Right? So A.T. Jones here is in 1893. Is, could we take the history that Jones is in and could we compare it? Could we lay it down over top of the history of the first generation, I guess is what I'm asking. Can we see that both of them are a line? Any thoughts on that?
And then we would do the same with the third generation. And then the fourth generation. Could we not do that? Is that reasonable? We should be able to. Yeah. No, we, we haven't done it. We haven't <coughs> looked at each of these generations and tried to do that yet. Um, there was hints. Even Jeff had hints of this. But, but we never took the time to do it. Because we saw it in the past that we could take the pro progressive destructions of four. And we could see them all as a reform line but each one has a reform line itself. So, you know, we should be able to do this. Um, so what I'm saying is what Jones is going through here is definitely typifying the time that we're in. But Jones doesn't realize that. He doesn't realize that he's in the second generation since 1888. He's just five years into it, right? But he's looking at these the wars that are going to happen, this ruin that's going to come upon the world. And you could see how somebody alive at that time, especially if you were fighting in a war in Europe, in the trenches, that this would have been extremely apocalyptic, what you were witnessing. Would the time of trouble, great time of trouble, fit, fit at the end of that? Well, yes. So I think that you can take these wars and you can take their destruction to parallel the ruin that's going to come with the seven last plagues. But it's just not the seven last plagues, even though it has some parallels. So when we look at what Jones is saying, we can see that he's describing our history, but he thinks it's going to be his history, but it is his history. Then in a sense, what he's saying is going to happen, just not the completeness of the Sunday law that he's expecting. Because changes are going to come as these we go through these generations. New issues are going to arise. And the apostasy is going to progress, both with the Protestants and also with Seventh-day Adventists and also with the world itself. Things are going to get much worse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Jones goes on, and he says, and then the next was that the apostate Jewish church, so this is his summary of what he's been doing in the previous five presentations, was that the, the apostate Jewish church joined herself to Caesar in order to get rid of the Lord. The apostate Romish church joined herself to Caesar in order to get rid of the Sabbath of the Lord. And the apostate churches now have joined themselves to Caesar in order to get rid of the Sabbath of the Lord. And the only thing that God could do for the apostate Jewish church when she joined herself to Caesar was to destroy it. But before he destroyed it, he called out all who would be his. The Jewish church was church and nation in one so that when that was destroyed, the lesson was set before the world for both churches and nations. It was the Jewish nation and the Jewish church both turning the back upon God. And when the Jewish church put God out of the way, that was the Jewish nation doing the same thing. Now, when that was done, the nation was to be destroyed, but the church was to be destroyed too. And so the effect of this thing upon the church and the nation was the same thing. It was ruined. When the Roman church followed the same way, that ruined the Roman Empire. And when this nation has gone in the same way, the only thing that remains is ruin. And ruin for the nation is ruin for the church too. Now, of course, Jones, when he's talking about the church here and the nation, he's talking about Protestants and the United States. So this is, this is the Republican Protestant beast, right? But when we look at this history of the four generations of Adventism, how do we get Adventism involved in this? What is it that jo Jones is not seeing yet about Adventism? And, and he should see because he's already rehearsed some of, of the history 
that parallels the history of Adventism. He's only seen the first generation play out. So he, he saw the first generation. Now he's in the second generation. And he just believes that the Sunday law is going to come right away. But he hasn't considered, he's considered the church, the United States. And he's considered, of course, the nation itself. But he hasn't considered the condition of the Adventist church. That is, he doesn't understand that the Adventist church, if he had understood the past, must also go through a progressive destruction of four. It has to, it, it goes through these four generations because that's always happened, right? Yeah, you can see now, now, for Seventh-day Adventists, many just believe, well, the church is going to go through. The ship's going to go through. Um, we're just going to trust in the church. And don't see how much they're like the Jews in the time of Christ. And they don't see the condition that the church is in. Because they're in the same condition and they don't want to see it. They want to think they're all right when they're all wrong. But also, do we not recognize that this must apply to this movement as well? Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. Okay. Now, why is that? I mean, we've taught this. Well, before. We've, yeah. Hey, Jeff. Well, we've gone through issues and July 18th, uh, So, so we've, seen, yeah. So we've seen how the movement has continually divided, right? Now yeah. we know that the illustration that that we've talked about, and we started talking about this at least in 2017, was about Judas, right? We might have started talking about it more, but we were looking at how midnight, that the dividing line had to do with the Passover. Right, that Judas is going to betray Christ, and then we started saying that the church is going to betray this movement, right? But wouldn't we have to see that the betrayal must occur within the movement? And then we saw that it did, right? We saw this separation, and if July 18th. Um, if we understand it correctly, it parallels the cross, right? The disappointment of the disciples parallels October 22nd, 1844. And, do, and we see different groups doing different things in response to these disappointments. And we know that this movement, if it's going to fulfill history, Two things happen. It divides, but it also unites, right? Agreed. So we know that we're heading towards the upper room. And if we're not, we're heading towards Judas's noose. Correct? There are yeah. only two choices. Right. And so we have to decide, are we going to be, are we going to, well, we could even decide, are we going to be the Peter that denies Christ or the Peter that uh, Christ puts, um, that gives him a special place in the church? He's going to be basically the leader of the church. You know, because we have the Peter before the cross and the Peter after the cross. You know, who are we going to be? What kind of character are we going to have? And then when we look at coming out of her, my people, that she be not partakers of her sins and that she received not of her plagues. Well, the question is, if we're going to make a call to come out of her, we must be out of her ourselves. Or we would have to say, go out of her. Right. But the message is come out of her, my people. 
And so many of us are still in apostasy. We're still in captivity to Babylon. The church is not Babylon. But the church is captive, is it not? Yes, very much. Yeah, definitely. Okay. <clears throat> the last night we noticed the papacy, that her work is to get all nations back under her influence. And when she has got all nations there and congratulates herself, saying, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow, then what is it that comes right away? The plagues. Now, we know that the papacy is going to be placed upon the throne of the earth. Um, this is, is what happens. This is the Sunday law. But the papacy is set upon the throne of the earth, not by itself, right? The United States puts the papacy on the throne of the earth. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet all come together in that sense. But it's going to be the United States leading out in this Sunday law, not the papacy. Papacy is placed upon the throne of the earth by default, not really by the choice of the globalists or of the United States. That's not what their goal is. But they do so by exalting the Sunday. <clears throat> then the same thing will happen to this nation that happened to other nations when God turned away from when, when they turned away from God. And we are right in the whirlpool of the events that bring all this. The same thing is soon to come here. It came upon the other nations when they forgot God. There are seven distinct points, each one of which brings us to the events of the third angel's message. Now, it's kind of interesting that he has seven distinct points. I mean, for us, whether he's thinking about that as, you know, significant or not, the number itself, I don't know. It doesn't seem that he is. But each one of which brings us to the events of the third angel's message, which is to save the people who will be saved before the world ends. So this is the everlasting gospel. It's a three-step test, testing prophetic message. But does it not have seven distinct waymarks? And then he says they are not manufactured points either. Not a single one of them is manufactured. Each one of them is simply the consequence of things that stand before the eyes of everybody in this world. That was the text to start with, you know. The people who will now see what is soon to come upon us by what is being transacted before us will no longer trust in human inventions and will feel that the Holy Spirit must be recognized, received, and presented to the people. So all I have attempted to do in these lessons that we have had is to take what stands before us in the world and see what is soon to come upon us. <laughs> Not simply what is to come upon us, but what is soon to come upon us, and it is bound to do it. There is no escape from the things that everybody in the world can see and must see, whether their eyes are open or not, whether they believe what is coming. That is not the question. They cannot help seeing what they see. There's no escape for them but the third angel's message. Now, you know, again, <coughs> we know that Jones here in 1893 is seeing that the Sunday law must be coming. But you can see how as time goes on and the problems that exist within, within the church must have been very discouraging for Jones. To see the rejection of the message, to see the infighting that occurs, to see the treatment of Ellen White, even though he eventually is going to somewhat turn against her, believing that she's controlled by others. Well, that sounds familiar, don't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, for this movement, it sounds very familiar. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. And, 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 it, and what Jones did, you know, if we, and we're going to look at his history much in much more detail, is he... He tried to take the work into his own hands. He tried to complete the work almost by himself 
He wanted to bring others along with him, of course. But the thing is, he couldn't do it. And one is because it wasn't the time, but also he hadn't really the experience that he needed in the third angel's message, even though God used him, because he didn't fully understand the first and second angel's messages. So he brought a message that brought uh, conviction, repentance, confession. And Ellen White acknowledges this, but this is all just typical. And we can definitely see how it applies to this movement. And there is no escape for us, but the third angel's message, as well as the first and second angel's message. Because the first and second angel's messages are also righteousness by faith, not just the third. The third is righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, in reality, worked out in the life, demonstrated. Because after the work of the first and second angel, you now have the two classes of worshipers that have been prepared and are going to be demonstrated. But for this movement, we can't see that yet. <clears throat> we don't see that this movement has to come. To the upper room it just has to and if it doesn't then this movement's purpose won't be totally wasted but somebody else will have to come and take up the work now we can't see that whether it's coming or not but what we can see is is our responsibility that's all god's ever going to show us and we have all these evidences that God's leading us in this direction, that we are going to divorce from the strange wives. And, and apparently, when we look at the story of Ezra chapter 10, which Aran and I were talking about earlier, is it's the 777th cha um, chapter from the end of the Bible. Ezra chapter 10, where we have the 20th day of the ninth month. And it's pointing us forward to something. Which we can see in our lines, there are there is time that God has given us to accomplish this work. And we want to have the work done now. But it's not going to be done now. In the way that we want that is jesus is not going to come back we're not going to have the sunday law back because we can't put the cart before the horse you can't harvest if you haven't planted now let us follow a little further as to what it means to us we have found that all the power of this earth is now under the influence of the papacy you see that it is now we can definitely see that the powers of this earth of the earth right now are under the influence of the man of sin. Even though they have their own minds and they have their own goals, the globalists and the Protestants, they are working their way into the hands of the papacy. You see that it is. But who is running the papacy? Who is working against the church of God? Satan. By whom did he work when Christ was on earth, the earth? The dragon. By whom did he work when the church was in the wilderness? The beast. By whom does the, he work against the remnant? By the image. By the dragon. By the beast. And by the false prophet. The image. These are the three instruments through which he makes war against the church of God from the birth of Christ until the end of the world. So notice he's going to take Revelation 12, 13, and 17 and lay them out in this way, right? Because he's going to understand that the dragon is pagan Rome and the composite beast is papal Rome. And that the image of the beast being set up is Revelation 17. Connected to Revelation 13. So the, 
the two horned beast, which is going to form the image of the beast, is connected to that beast in Revelation 17, specifically to the, the eighth, right? Which is how they would have understood this. They wouldn't understand it the way that we do. But we can see that what they're, what Jones is saying is still valid. Then all the powers of this earth are in the hands of Satan to wield against the church. Then how long do you suppose it is going to be before that verse is fulfilled? In which it is said that Satan works with all power, all power signs and flying wonders, right? He has got it, hasn't he? All the power that earth knows, all the power that is in the realm where Satan is, all the power that is in this earth, this is now in his hands. He's going to work with all power, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. What has he that power for? Is it not to use it? Then do you suppose he is going to stand idle very long, especially when God's people are calling upon God and consecrating themselves to him, which is God, right? That is what makes Satan so mad. The commandments of God are kept and the testimony of Jesus Christ is manifested. So you can see here, Jones understands something quite important, that you can't have Satan doing this work if God's people aren't keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, right? If you don't have a command, commandment-keeping people, you can't have the persecution that comes with that. And this is what Jones, part of what Jones does not see, is that the church is not in the condition that it needs to be. Sure, there's repentance and confession. Confession and repentance. It's occurring under this preaching at this this um, general conference. But one of the problems that we have here, and, and I think it's the problem that, that um, Jones is having specifically, is we see governments doing certain things. But what about the people themselves? Are the people really supporting the direction that the government is going in 1893. I mean, we know there's lots of wicked people, but there's also a lot of people who may not understand the third angel's message. But Jones even alludes to it that not all of these people really support what is being done by the churches or by their governments. And one of the things we see is that all of the world wonders after the beast. That is, we have a, a situation where it's not just governments and churches acting in a certain way, but it's the people acting in a certain way. And we, I don't think in 1893 you have the spiritual condition that you see today. Would we agree with that? Yes. You have more secularism today and more and false evil. Uh, and evil. Creatures. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So we can see that things are much worse than Jones could have imagined. I mean, they're much worse than we could have imagined 30 years ago. The world is in a state that, you know, I mean, in, in some ways we're not shocked by it anymore because we're so used to it. But think back 30 years ago, if you had picked up the papers of today, or if you could look at what's on the internet, you would be in utter shock. And we don't realize how desensitized we become. I remember once... Um, when I was at Silver Hills, I was there for about a year and um, I had to drive my sister-in-law back to Edmonton. And 
she had been there for quite a while as well, maybe about six, seven months or so. And when we were driving in, into Edmonton, the one thing we noticed is the billboards. So when we are out in the country, out in nature, you become open to everything around you. But when you're living in the city, you have to shut off your mind to all of these influences. And we just couldn't believe how much wickedness we saw. It just became evident because we had become undesensitized by being in nature. You know, if you don't watch television, you know, for a number of years and you turn on the TV and let's say you used to watch television, you wouldn't have noticed all the things happening. But now you would turn on the TV, you would see it's much worse than you imagined, even if it wasn't any different. So we become desensitized to what's happening around us. So the world is much worse than we realize. But definitely in Jones Day, if we would look at Jones Day, we would say, well, the world's in pretty good shape compared to what it is today. Then there is that power in his hand to wield against the church of God, against God, his Sabbath, and those who respect the Lord in his Sabbath, because that is the sign of allegiance to the Lord. Well, then anybody who is going to be faithful to God, I say again, has got to do that in the face of all the power that there is in the world, all the power that the world knows of every possible kind. Then, brethren, the thing for you and me to decide right now is whether we are going any further or not. Now, think about this in the context of the pandemic and the mandates. What power do we look to? Would we join with the protesters protesting? And this is what Jones was talking about earlier, about the, uh, at the beginning of these studies, you know, about signing um, um, petitions. And he says that time is past. What power are we looking to to fight against the forces of darkness that have taken the world under its control? Are we going to use the power of the state, the power of the ballot, the power of the petition, the power Christian of the nationalism, what they call it now? What is it? What's that? They, they call it Christian nationalism now. Okay, Christian nationalism. Because even though we might sympathize to some degree with what we with the people that are opposed to what is occurring in the world, we would we would agree with them, we would sympathize, but we wouldn't or we shouldn't think that the solution that they're seeking is the correct solution. Because we need the power of God, because this is all the power of the world. You're not going to have any of the power of the world on your side. Then, brethren, the thing for you and me to decide right now is whether we're going any further or not. We are to decide whether we're going any further or stop right here. Just as certainly as we decide to stand by the profession we have made, just as certainly as we decide to stand by the law of God and faithfulness to our profession, we have to decide it in the face of all the power that this world knows, with Satan in possession of this power and using it. Then we are to maintain our allegiance to God and his law against all consideration of any earthly support or protection. Does it not become the people of God who are to stand by the law of God that they depend alone upon God? For there's nothing else under the sun to depend upon. And we see it. We see people who believe that the answer is Donald Trump. We see people who believe that the answer is protests. We see people who believe the answer is petitions. But the answer is simply the power of God. 
protest, peti petitions, the ballot, none of those things are going to save us. We are to warn the people of the world against this power and against the working of it, to draw them away from it unto God. Now, can I do that with any force at all if I have any connection with the world or worldliness? Congregation says no. If I may partake of a worldly spirit and of a worldly disposition and inclination, I want to know how I'm going to warn the people to separate from the world utterly. How is there going to be enough force in my words to get anybody to do it? Can you tell? Can you tell how you can do it? I do not care whether you are a minister or not. If you are only a Seventh-day Adventist or even only a professed Seventh-day Adventist, you need not be a minister, but only a professed Seventh-day Adventist to answer this question. I want to know, how are you going to make the profession worth anything or have any power at all upon the people of this world if you are in any way connected with this world in spirit, in mind, in thought, in wishes, in inclinations? No, sir. A hair's breadth, a connection with the world as thin as a hair, will rob you of the power that there must be in this call that will warn the world against this evil power of the world so that they shall be utterly separated from it. So one of the ironies that I see in this movement is that we actually sympathize with who? Who does this movement sympathize with? Do we sympathize with the, the, the Democrats? Do we sympathize with the Democrats? Probably the Republicans. Yeah, the Republicans, right? And yet, you know, we profess to be teaching, well, Trump's going to come into power and he's going to bring in the Sunday law. And yet we, we sympathize with Trump, right? In many ways. Mm -hmm. You know, we're conservatives. We can, can sympathize with some of the professions of, of the Republicans. But we know that they're no different than the Democrats. And maybe in some ways Trump himself personally is different. But it doesn't really matter. Because if we're sympathizing with the world, because we know Trump is worldly, he's not a Christian. He doesn't look to the power of God to solve the problems that exist in the world, let alone in his own life. We can't expect that, um, you know, that somehow we're on the right side of things. And especially since... We have in our spirit, our mind, in our thought, in our wishes, and in our inclinations. Only the world. So we need to be utterly separated from the world if we are going to give the message of the third angel, let alone the message of the first and second angel. Then, brethren, if there is going to be any power to our message from this time forth, what are we to do? We are to just cut loose from everything that this world knows. Are you ready? Nor is it enough for you to, act, to ask if you are ready, but I want to ask, is it done? Is it done? The congregation says yes. That is a splendid picture that Brother Porter read a while ago, that the prophet looked for those who give this message, but looked too low, said the angel, look higher. Thank the Lord that they are above the world. That is where they belong, above the world, upon a foundation which God has established for them to walk upon. And everyone who is down so low that anyone has to look to the world to see them, such as these cannot give the third angel's message. We are to be above the world. Then cut loose, brethren. 
Then, brethren, the time has come, as never before in this world, that there must be a separation from the world. I have chosen you out of the world, says Jesus. Now that he has chosen us, oh, let us seek him day by day, that he may ordain us. Christ said to his disciples, I've chosen you and ordained you. Now he has chosen us. Let us see that he has ordained us to the work that he has for us. And the work is to carry the word of God against all the power that this world knows and to separate a people from the world so entirely separated unto God that they will disregard utterly the power of this world and all its connection. That brings us to consecration again, doesn't it? Thank the Lord that it does. And we can hold to the third angel's message. We cannot stand by that. We cannot have the spirit of it or do the work of it without just that consecration. Now, there's another thing. The people who stand by the law of God are not going to be thought very well of all the way through. No, sir. They're not going to be praised and petted and made much of and courted and pa palavered over. Um, no, sir. Perhaps I had better read a passage here on that. I will read from The Great Controversy, Volume 4, page 590. The great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by violation of the Sabbath, sun, Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced, and that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Thus, the accusation urged of old against the servant of God will be repeated upon grounds equally well established. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and hast followed Balaam. As the wrath of the people shall be excited by false charges, they will pursue a course to God's ambassadors very similar to that which apostate Israel pursued toward Elijah, right? So, of course, we, we're aware of this, that when you stand for God, you're going to be opposed by those that don't stand for God. Uh, again, we read on page 592 as follows. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. The conscientious scruples will be pronounced against obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. In legislative halls and courts of justice, commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. A false coloring will be given to their words, and the worst construction will be put upon their motives. Now, when we think about this, when we think about the Sunday law in the 1990s, and we, we read these statements, we looked at the moral majority as the movement that was going to lead to the Sunday law in the United States, and thus to the Sunday law, uh, the Sunday laws around the world. But now we see a much different picture. We now see that right is considered wrong and wrong is considered right. Is this a very conservative Christian moral um, movement that is going to be bringing about these accusations against God's people. That is, the question is, are we going to see a huge swing from the left to the right as far as morality is concerned? 
or are we still going to have this sort of quasi morality for lack of a better word the type of morality that um doesn't um you know the type of morality that's just based on you know thou shalt not judge because we've seen both types of persecution you can have persecution from people who have so-called high moral standards and you can have persecution from people who don't pretty much don't have any kind of moral standard at all at all and do we know what direction the world's going to go based upon this statement Well, it'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah and the religious right. Yeah, so we, right. So so we know that the world is in the condition of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's those that are living this life of licentiousness who are going to be bringing about this persecution against a group of people whose only fault is they don't acknowledge the papal Sabbath. And they acknowledge God's Sabbath, correct? Yes. So, I mean, I struggle with this. I mean, and I've talked about it before, you know, back in the 90s, how were we going to get this world that was moving towards secularism to the point that it would be a Christian nation again, promoting the Ten Commandments, so to speak? But I don't think they're promoting the Ten Commandments. I think they're just promoting the world's commandments. Mm -hmm. And the world's commandments are going to include Sunday observance. Christians are accepting the immorality that exists in the world. Why? Why are Christians moving towards an acceptance of the licentiousness that exists in the world. We talked about it before. One reason was money, right? The schools? Christians do not speak out against the sins of the world anymore, especially the popular sins. Is that going to change? Or is it going to stay the same? Or is it even going to get worse? But we just have no idea what sin is. I think it's going to get worse till we don't know what sin is. Mm -hmm. But I think we're almost halfway there. Anyway. Mm -hmm. In testimony number 32, page 208, I read a testimony that was given in 1885, seven years ago. Men are sleeping. Satan is actively arranging matters so that the Lord's people may not have mercy or justice. Have we seen that? Is Satan, has Satan come to the point where we now no longer have mercy or justice? Was there any mercy or justice in the mandates? No. People lost jobs simply because they didn't want to get a vaccination, which was perfectly their right to refuse. A vaccination that... Um, yeah, it has consequences. For some. Yeah. Right. So people have a right to refuse it. Whether, whether what you think about the effectiveness of the vaccine or not isn't really the issue. The issue is that man's rights to refuse something put into their body was violated. Now, of course, we can always accept the consequences of our own actions. As a Christian, we don't stand up for our rights. We accept the consequences of our choices. At least that's what I believe. We don't get vaccinated. We accept the consequences of that, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it means we lose our job, right? That's the way the Christian would act.
If we have a conviction that something's wrong, we accept the consequences of that conviction. When I became a Seventh-day Adventist, it definitely affected my ability to earn money, to have certain types of jobs. But I accepted the consequences of that. I didn't blame the world and think that, you know, somehow the world has to bow to my wishes. I just accepted that we follow God and there's consequences with following God. But often we don't want those consequences. We'd like to be able to follow God and everything go our way. We'd like to be able to live in the world and that the world, we look to the world to support us. Mm -hmm. But only God is the one that can support us. How could it be expected that we should have mercy and justice when all the power of the governments on the earth is in the hands of the papacy and being run by Satan? How could you expect justice? And how could you expect justice when all the power of this earth is set against the people of God by Satan himself? That is not justice. We could not expect it. That brings us to the point that we are to be so utterly cut loose from this world that we will not expect any protection. We will not expect any justice, any mercy even from it. If it comes, if it comes, it will be only the mercy of God that draws it in spite of themselves. When we are in a position that the only mercy that we can expect of the earth is what God draws from them, then where is our dependence? In God only. We are not going to be petted and made much of at all. And this is being, then, this being so, every kind of reproach will be manufactured and spread against us. I want to know how anybody is going to stand faithful to the third angel's message and do the work of that message who cares particularly what people say about him and has much respect for reputation or puts his dependence upon reputation. He cannot do it. But thank the Lord, God has something a great deal better for us to depend upon, and that is character. Let us not forget that Jesus, our example in this world, made himself of no reputation. Now then, that settles it, that the people who are to give the third angel's message and to stand faithful to God in the world are to do it with respect to character only. And no question of reputation can ever come into the calculation. No question of reputation as to how or what men may think or say can ever come into our calculations anymore. Never. Because reputation will not save a man. If he is going to have any respect to reputation, if that is going to come into his mind at all, then he would better give up the whole thing because he cannot have it if he stands by the third angel's message. Then right now, tonight, brethren, is the time to give up all such professions because in doing that, you will be a relief to your brethren. If you are going to compromise with this thing at all, you'd better do it do so right now because the farther you go and then compromise the harder you will make it for your brethren therefore unless you are going to clear going clear through just stop tonight and go the other way and be done with it and let the others that are going straight ahead be free now i've often said this about people who don't believe in adventism why are they still in the adventist church well because they of course have positions of power and authority and uh, their jobs are dependent upon it and so forth. But I mean, if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, why be a Seventh-day Adventist? If you're of the world, why make even a profession of following Christ? God would rather that you were cold or hot. We have come to the parting of the ways and let everyone decide in view of no dependence on anything that is in this world. <clears throat> no consideration that this world can present can come into the calculation. No question of reputation or what men will think ever comes into the calculation. When all the power of the world stands against those who will maintain their allegiance to God, then the character of Jesus Christ is worth 10,000 times 10,000 reputations that anybody can manufacture anyway. A reputation is a big thing in the eyes of the world. With God, a reputation does not amount to anything. A reputation is all that Satan has to offer is all he has to build on. And that statement that is often quoted is correct enough from the man in whose mouth it is put by the writer who preached it. The dearest treasure that mortal times afford is spotless reputation. 
And that was well enough for him, for reputation was all he had. And then he went on to say he had lost his, and he was very much grieved, saying, oh, my reputation, my reputation, I have lost my reputation. And when he had lost that, of course, he had nothing to support him. He was out entirely. He did not have character, you see, but only reputation to depend upon. That sentiment comes from him very properly, from the character into whose mouth it was put by him who write it. But it is a lie. It is a lie. The dearest treasure that mortal times afford is not spotless reputation. The dearest treasure that either mortal or immortal times afford is spotless character. And the only spotless character that ever appeared in this world is the character of Jesus Christ. And that character, he comes and gives to you and me a free, blessed gift from him who made it. Then, brethren, let us all let all questions of reputation to let, let all questions of reputation to the winds. That is where they belong. For reputation is as unstable as the winds, while character is as fixed as eternity. Then let all questions of reputation go. Let us have character. Let us have that character that will fit us for the judgment. Then, though Satan with all his power might succeed in saddling upon us the worst reputation he can invent, thank the Lord we have got a character that will stand in the judgment. Then we can afford to let the world and reputation both go. In Jesus Christ, we have something better. And that is not all. There's another phase of it. The time is coming when anybody who stands by the third angel's message of the Sabbath of the Lord and maintains his allegiance to that cannot buy anything or sell anything in this world. Then everyone who professes to be a Seventh-day Adventist, who has a profession of the third angel's message, needs to decide now as to whether he is going to stand by that message against all questions and considerations of property or possessions in this world. No question. No calculations as to property or business interests in this world can come into our calculations or into our work now. No question of that kind can enter into the calculations of any Seventh-day Adventist from this time on. If it does, he might as well stop right here. For if I'm going to let questions as to whether I can have so much or how this business affair is going to come out and whether I'm going to lose by that means or gain by this if I stand by the Sabbath, if I'm going to let such questions come into my calculations, then I'd better let property interests have full place and go with it and be done with it. But where is that business, this property, that business, this property going? What am I questioning and hesitating about? It is all going to destruction. Then if there is any string that binds me in sympathy with that thing, when it goes, where will I go? I will go with it, of course. Suppose that string is only the size of a silken hair. Will it take me with it? Yes. Then, brethren, it is time to cut loose. So we have come to the parting of the ways again. Henceforth, he who stands in allegiance to the third angel's message must do it, and he will do it with no calculation at, at all that any question of Profit, money, or property, or anything of the kind will ever bear the weight of a feather or the weight of a hair as to how he's going to act with respect to the third angel's message. That is so. That is in it. For there is the statement that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, he need not believe in it at all. But the law says keep Sunday, and if he does, then what? He has compromised with Satan and has accepted the sign of Satan instead of Christ. He has put Satan above Christ and is obeying the power of the world and not the words of Christ. And how much power over the world is that man going to have to save him? The man who com compromises with Sunday laws to the extent that he will stop work and observe Sunday because the law says so. While, he is, while still thinking that he is keeping the Sabbath, has put Satan above Christ. He's putting dependence upon earthly power. But in whose hands is that power? In the hands of Satan. Then is he not, according to his own profession and actions, 
depending on Satan, just as much as upon Christ? Are they partners? No, sir. Well, then let us not let him come into the partnership, brethren. No man who holds his allegiance to the third angel's message will allow Satan to come into such a partnership as that. Isn't the Sabbath a sign of what God is to a man? Isn't it a sign of the true God? And is not God what he is? Then is it not a sign of what God is as well as that he is? Then the Sabbath being a sign of what God is as well as that he is. What is he? Oh, he is the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. He is our life. <clears throat> so Jones here, I mean, his argument is obviously extremely powerful. But we know that it isn't just about reputation and the things of the world that hold us to the world. There's jealousy. There's hurt feelings. There's our opinions, our pride. All these things hold us to the world just as much as any of these things that Jones has mentioned reputation or property. <clears throat> and so we know that the, the Sabbath is a sign, but it's a sign that God sanctifies us. He makes us holy. So Jones goes on and says, good. Then the Sabbath is the sign of what God is to the man who believes him. But where do we find God? Where alone can anybody find God? In Jesus Christ. No man knoweth the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Then to us, Christ is God. To this world and to all intelligent creatures, Christ is God. Then is not the Sabbath the sign of what Christ is to man? Then when we observe it, it is the sign of what Christ is to us. Then for me to keep Sunday, because the law says so, is to say that Sunday is just as much to me as the Sabbath is. Oh, well, that is only to say that Satan is as much to me as Christ is. And when that is so, Christ does not amount to much to me. When Christ is so little to me that I will put the sign of the power of the papacy, which is only the sign of the power of Satan, on a level with the sign of what Christ is to me, then Christ isn't anything to me. If Christ is not all, what is he? He is all and in all. If he is not all to me, then what is he to me? He is nothing. That brings us again to the fact that now, brethren, we have got to stand to this sign against every consideration that earth can mention. That is not all yet. There's another thought in this verse. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image and of the beast should be killed. Then the time will come when he who stands to his allegiance to the third angel's message will have the penalty of death pronounced upon him. His life will be forfeited and declared forfeited by the powers of this earth in whose reach he is. Then can any question of life come into our calculations now? Can it, brethren? Shall a man weigh up what his life is worth now and have that to weigh anything in his calculations in the third angel's message as to whether he is going to stand by it or not? These things are worth thinking of. That is what they mean. If I'm going to allow my life to weigh anything at all in my calculations of allegiance to the third angel's message, then what is the use of my going any farther with this message? Why not stop right here tonight? The fact is, as stated there, <coughs> that this life will be forfeited if I stand by the message. So if we are to let the question weigh anything with us, we better stop right here and be done with it. Don't you know that the penalty of death is in itself, in every step, even the first step, that is taken in persecution? It is certainly there. It is not there in the words. It is not there in the pronounced penalty. But it is there. Because when the government undertakes to enforce religious laws, it is always to save the government. 
always for the salvation of the government. This Sunday act of Congress has already been declared to be for that purpose. Now, people who do not obey the Sunday laws, of course, are fine and they don't pay their fine. Sabbath keepers don't, of course. They have to go to prison and to satisfy the fine and they serve out the, the time and they are turned tuned out. Must be turned out. I don't know. Anyway, then they go to work on Sunday again. And then they are fined again and are imprisoned to serve out the fine and then turned out again. And they go to work on Sunday again, of course, when it comes and the fine is made heavier and that makes the imprisonment longer. But none of it stops the Sunday work, which is the one thing aimed at. Therefore, don't you see that as heavier penalties are laid on without reaching what the government is after, it will simply have to reach the heaviest penalty at last, and that is death. Then the penalty of death is in every Sunday law that is ever made, that was ever made on this earth in itself, just as certainly as the law is to be enforced and carried into effect. For this reason, the historian Gibbon told the world more than a hundred years ago that it is incumbent upon the authors of persecution previously to reflect whether they are determined to support it in the last extreme. They excite the flame which they strive to extinguish, and it soon becomes necessary necessary to chastise the contumacy as well as the crime of the offender. The fine which he is unable or unwilling to discharge exposes his person to the severity of the law, and his contempt of lighter penalties suggests the use and propriety of capital punishment. So that's where we're going to end on that light note. But we know that the reason why religious laws end in this way is because a person who's going to be faithful to God cannot submit to these laws. And so these types of laws are always going to lead to the death penalty if they're followed through with. And that's what we're going to see. Any, any final thoughts? I did lots of reading today. We didn't have huge amounts of discussion. Now, we're not having to study this uh, Sabbath afternoon, like I originally had said um, in the email. I, I forgot that we had a fifth Sabbath. And so the American group has uh, this Sabbath. Um, The American group has a fifth Sabbath, you said? Um, I mean, we mean fifth Sabbath. Well, anyway, there was five Sabbaths or something. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make, yeah, because the last the last month there was five Sabbaths. Okay. Right. So so this Sabbath I thought was going to be the Canadian group. But it's the American group again. Does that make sense? Yeah. But how does that um, so work? Into, just, how does that work? And do you not have a study? <laughs> well, because when the American group has a study, I don't have a study in the afternoon. Oh, I got you. Okay. Because Daniel Fontenot is doing a study, and I'm not doing a study when he is. I see. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, so I originally kind of planned to do some stuff tomorrow afternoon, which I'm going to have to wait till next Friday to do. But I, I do want to lay out this chronology again. Because um, I want people to see quite clearly how this all fits together. And, and maybe we can lay out uh, each of the four generations and see how they parallel each other. So we'll see if we can do that next Friday. Well, thanks, everyone. Our time is up. And uh, we're going to end this study with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we, again, are so very thankful for the Sabbath, for our fellowship, 
We pray for the meeting tomorrow morning that Dwight's presenting. And also the study I'll be doing with Ryan in the afternoon. So we just pray that um, uh, that will go well. Um, we know, Lord, that we have not severed every connection with the world. That we can't have a thread to link us our sentiments to the things of this world. We ask that we can be in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and that when told to look a little higher, we will see um, that we are on that path to the celestial city. Help us, Lord, to follow and serve you and be with each person searching for truth is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.